Thank you very much for having me. And um, I want to give a huge shout out to Fogus and David Nolan. Um, without them, there would be no demo. Uh, <laughs> without them, I would just be a pool of uh, tears, a different kind on stage. Um, there's a certain amount of like magic unicornness about closure. And maybe it's because it's not trying to do too much, but the fact that Closure and Closure Script can actually kind of do the right thing in pretty much the same way and share data across address spaces is a really big thing. And I mean, a, a lot of ranting and hand waving that I do over my presentations is about how developers think about things in one address space or in one way and forget about everything else. And allowing, having a language that has the same semantics and very similar characteristics across different address spaces, across different platforms is a pretty amazing thing. So I mean, I think there should be a shout out to Rich, to the folks who did Closure Script, just because they did it right. And watching some other languages flail about it and not do it right, it's, it, it, it's cool that Closure did it right. So what's my history? I'm, I founded the Lyft Web Framework Project back um, six years ago. I actually joined the Scala community officially um, seven years ago, almost to the day, uh, which was kind of somewhat amusing to me because I was giving a presentation at DC Scala and I realized there were more people in the room at DC Scala than there were on the Scala mailing list back seven years ago. Um, I traced my roots just after I graduated from law school to, yes, I'm a lawyer, um, to writing software for Next Step. And uh, who here has ever used Next or Next Step? Okay, woo, wow, that's pretty awesome. Um, I wrote a spreadsheet for Next Step called Mesa, and it turns out um, IBM and Reuters were doing a, an, a prior art search because they were being sued by a patent troll who had tried to get a patent on real-time trading through spreadsheets, and it turns out that I had the original art back in 1992. Yeah, but the other thing is spreadsheets are in my veins and the idea of getting rid of developers and letting business people get closer and closer to computation is really important to me and you know it's like building developer tools is great and you know building a web framework is cool but building stuff that really lets lets the business people do what they really want to do is important and taking a look at what happened with VisiCalc and 123 Excel these days, you know, Excel's the most popular programming language in the world. There's something there. And interestingly, I'm feeling more and more like there's something there where closure is the substrate to enable it. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And I also have to do a shout out to my consultancy, Brick Alloy. We launched back at um, Strange Loop. Yes, um, you know, do all the Alex Miller gigs. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, the pain of tears. You have different tiers in your computing system. You have different languages for each of the tiers. You have different semantics for the different languages and the different runtimes at each of the tiers. And there's always an impedance mismatch. How many billions of dollars have companies spent acquiring business intelligence, BI tool companies? You know, it's a substantial amount. BI represents a lot, and BI represents a lot of the thing of getting the developers out of the way so the business people can ask the kind of questions that they want to ask. But if you think about business objects in SQL, then going into Excel, think of the impedance mismatch there. And this isn't just the impedance mismatch between SQL and Java, or the impedance mismatch between um, Scala on the server and JavaScript in the browser. It's, it's a much deeper impedance mismatch because you're asking questions about tabular data in entirely different ways. You're asking questions about your tabular data in a way um, that has great set theory foundation on the SQL server and has a bunch of, wow, this just works in Excel. <laughs> And sometimes things are just wrong, and you know we're, we're seeing the the resurgence of Java because Java enables big data. Java is Hadoop. Java is what a lot of businesses are starting to do their processing in. And it turns out that MapReduce in Java is just wrong. Java has entirely the wrong semantics for doing MapReduce. So I think 
Closure can come to the rescue. I think Closure can come to the rescue because Closure can run across tiers, because Closure has great semantics for data manipulation. And the semantics run in two different forms. One of the forms that the semantics run in is functional. Okay, I have a function, I'm going to apply it to some data, more data, a lot of data. Um, there's a bullet point that I didn't put in there, which is really, really good tools for doing inter-process communication. And um, Stuart you know, kicked off the, uh, the conference by talking about um, a way of serializing, marshalling data between address spaces. And one of the interesting things about um, Erlang and Clojure that compare to most of the OO languages is you're not carrying functionality and data around. And if you, take, if you think about all of the pain in Java serialization land, all of that pain or a substantial amount of that pain comes from the fact that you have functionality, methods, that are associated with your data, that are, that are intertwined with your data. Your data can't live without these things. Whereas in Clojure, in Erlang, you have functions that operate on the data rather than having the functions and the data intertwined. So you only have to serialize one thing. You only have to conceptually serialize one thing. And finally, there's core async. And core async is like my new favorite thing in the entire world. Um, <laughs> I kid you not, it's like, you know, I'm doing, uh, everything I do, I try to do with core async. Um, no, I, you laugh. I mean, the first thing I did when I actually sat down to do Clojure was, okay, I've got a browser here running Clojure script, I've got a server here, and they're gonna talk via core async, and they're not gonna know that they're in different tiers. And that was the presentation that I gave at Strange Loop. And, uh, the presentation that I'm giving today is, or the demo I'm going to give today is uh, layered on top of that. Um, but the other reason that Clojure comes to the rescue is because it compiles and runs across tiers. Because almost everything I can possibly think of, with the exception of Arduino, I wrote this slide and I realized, ah, oh, darn, Arduino is the exception. Okay, and my Ford Sync thing in the middle of my car, but that's something else entirely. Um, Everything runs either JVM bytecode or JavaScript. And JavaScript is a new assembly language, and you know, it works well as assembly language and not for much else. Um, so there are some exceptions, and I put the exceptions in parentheses to kind of highlight the reason why Clojure itself is maybe not the right language for everybody to write code in. And, you know, I'm standing in the room full of the people who believe, who spend days and lots of money traveling to come, see, come here. But at the end of the day, the closure syntax is very uninviting for the Excel set. And you, know, you, take a look at the, you take a look at R and languages like Python, which are doing pretty well in kind of Excel plus analytics land. They have a more inviting syntax. Um, <laughs> Clojure is not declarative enough. And you can write a lot of DSLs in Clojure, but at the end of the day, what people describe when they write Excel spreadsheets is not a flow of control, is not a um, call-based hierarchy, but it is relationships. So when people write an Excel spreadsheet, they define the relationships among cells in the spreadsheet, and it is up to the spreadsheet engine to figure out the right um, path for computing, the right way to break the co computation up across cores, which Excel got a few years ago, um, a bunch of other stuff. So that when people do develop an Excel spreadsheet, they're thinking about dependencies. And us humans, we actually do relationships really well. We do dependencies really well. I mean, you know, it, it's baked into the, the fabric of our brains thinking about friends and, you know, family and generations of family. I mean, these things are important. And we work well that way rather than do this thing and then do this thing and then do this thing. But it turns out that core async and having a dependency tree like you have in Excel are oddly, especially with, um, with taps and um, malt, are oddly the same thing. This is another reason why core async is my new best friend. 
because <laughs> I can actually develop with, I don't have to explicitly develop um, a, uh, the, the uh, dependency graph for a computation because all I have to do is I talk about the relationships among um, the taps from one channel to another. Uh, finally, we don't want core async in other people's faces. It's a really, really, really powerful way of looking at the problem, but it's not necessarily a powerful way that end users will see, you know, the Excel set, the R set, um, will see solving the problems. So what we want is we want these functional semantics that we get from, uh, from Clojure, I almost said Scala. <laughs> is that the trap door over there? Woo! <laughs> We want our functional semantics across tiers. We want a pleasant introductory syntax and Excel-like semantics. We want that relationship piece. And we want the same semantics in streaming or batch. So if we're going to apply a particular computation to a set of data, that set of data that we apply the computation to should either be a collection of stuff, or we should be able to stream or in an ideal world, we should be able to run some computations across a historical data set and then continue to tick data in. And maybe even, if we're lucky, serialize state so that we can put that computation away or move it to another machine and then resume it later. I'm not going to show you all that stuff today, but that's kind of fantasy land. So let me talk about PLU and talk about how I got into Clojure. And I've been meaning to try out Clojure for quite a while. Um, and every time I picked up a Clojure book or a Lisp book, I would do it at night, and then I'd have dreams about parentheses. <laughs> and there was one time when I played um, Super Mario Galaxy and then read the Lisp book, <laughs> and those dreams were absolutely amazing. <laughs> and no, no drugs were involved. Um, so it, it took me a while to, to cotton on to Clojure. And I've been um, doing, I do consulting, and I've been finding interesting Clojure projects. So I'm doing one pure Java project right now. No, the client won't let me use anything else. I've pleaded and begged for some other JVM language now. Um, I'm doing a Scala Lyft project. The most interesting project I'm doing right now is a combination of Scala and Clojure, which is kind of cool. And it actually gets into some of the business semantics and how you surface dynamic business rules to a business person and yet have your stuff running in a well-typed program because the particular client has done a lot of work building, building up a type system that actually does the right thing. And I have a side project that I'm doing that is Clojure and Python. Um, anyway, PLU is my um, Clojure toolkit, and I developed PLU as kind of a joke. Um, do you guys know Mean Grape, Jay Edwards, on Twitter? Anyway, so, no, okay. More people use Next Step than no Jay. That's surprising. Um, so Jay and I were talking, and I'm like, I've, I need an excuse to learn Clojure. And he's like, okay, do a log analysis tool. And so I'm like, yeah, I hate Splunk. And so um, anybody here who's played Colossal Caves Adventures knows that um, a hollow voice says blue, and it's a magic word. And so the, I, the idea was I was going to write a log analysis tool using Clojure and using React. And I haven't quite gotten there yet, but it's a slow journey. And then I like signed up to speak at conferences like this, and so I actually had to open up a source code repository and put some stuff in. Um, right now, the key thing about PLU is that it does the uh, browser to server chat via core async. So you know, basically, when you're building your apps, all you have to do is um, send a message from one channel to another, and PLU knows how to serialize it and send it across address spaces and a bunch of other stuff. So you're not really thinking about sending a message to the, to the server. You're just saying, I'm, I'm sending a message to a channel, and the right thing happens underneath. Or the server receives a channel as part of a message and then can send a whole bunch of data back. Um, it's miscellaneous other stuff, and that includes um, copying and pasting Fogus's uh, um, JavaScript REPL, and then doing a little bit of enhancement and Focus actually sat down with me, thank you, sir, and did some enhancement for today's demo. 
Visi is a project that I've been working on for about two years, and it's kind of a back of the mind project, which is reimagining the spreadsheet. And rather than, rather than thinking about the spreadsheet as rows and columns, where you have formulas in cells, I think of the spreadsheet as relationships among data items. Um, the, the, the core parts of the model is you have sources of data, you have computation, and you have sinks. So as data flows through your model, you know, stuff flows in, wh whether it's static, tab static data or um, dynamic data, it doesn't really matter to the computation. The stuff flows in, the stuff flows out, and you can, cap you can put stuff in and you can capture the output and you can display the output. And oddly, it's like core async on the edges. Did I mention core async is my new best friend? Um, and I'd also like to say that it, it, the pluish visi ish thing, which I'm going to show today, is two things in one. And um, it's to a great degree thanks to Bodil and to Instaparse, because when I was at Emerging Languages, she showed off her um, lispy language and was talking about using Instaparse, but it compiled down to Clojure. And there was like this Blues Brothers thing where like, you know, the, the light comes in through the window and says, do you see the light? And I'm like, I see the light. And I realized that Clojure is a perfect substrate for writing a lot of other languages. Because with S expressions, they're easy enough to omit. You're not spitting out strings. And by the way, if you've ever seen any of my Lyft presentations, I hate vomiting strings. I hate code that vomits strings. Whereas if you can vomit, I'm sorry, if you can produce <laughs> well-formed data, and that data can then be consumed by something else, and the well, yet the well-formed data is simple enough to be able to manipulate by normal humans. And if you've ever seen the Scala AST and tried to write a Scala macro, you know, you're in the small minority of people who um, haven't gone insane. Um, yeah, I did a project on that too. Um, but closure is simple enough that you can actually emit it. You can emit a reasonable S expression that you can then shove into eval, that you can shove into um, eval or whatever the uh, JavaScript compiler that um, Fogus wrote that I liberally copied. And it's pretty easy to then use that as the sub substrate for a language. So let's actually look at the language that um, I've been reimagining spreadsheets as. And here we go. Um, we basically, and this, this is actually for the um, closure um, uh, Python project that I'm working on. Basically, um, an analyst firm wants to be able to do real-time analysis of Twitter feeds for sentiment. And, but what they want to be able to do is they want to be able to go in and tune the sentiment analysis based on specific client needs. So what we do is we define our source, and our source is Twitter. Now, that doesn't really necessarily mean anything. It's just a, a placeholder where we can shove data into the system. And you could conceivably have multiple sources. The sources are exposed underneath the covers as, yes, a core async channel. <laughs> I bet you're surprised there. Um, and then we have a function, which is add sentiment to a tweet. And what do we do? We get the, um, the text from the tweet. Now, this is actually oddly thinly veiled. Um, take the uh, Twitter variable and do um, uh, keyword text on it. But I wanted to make the syntax a little bit more inviting to Pythonese. And then we pipe that into a calc sentiment function. And then we um, create a new instance of the tweet with the sentiment assigned to it or with the sentiment added to it. And then, um, so we say with sentiment is a transformation of um, add sentiment to Twitter. And actually, that, that I realized when I was uh, looking at this slide five minutes before the presentation, what that really should be for people who think um, in terms of relationships, there shouldn't be an explicit transform. There shouldn't be an explicit map there. Because what they want to do is they just want to say add sentiment Twitter. They want to call the add sentiment function on the Twitter feed and have that be the feed. But you know that's for the next version. Um, and then we filter the sentiment. And 
What we do is we pull the sentiment out, and if it's positive is greater than two or negative is less than negative two, then we pass. Once again, I think this probably could be cleaned up and made less like um, Lisp, Pascal, Scala, and more like Excel. But you know, it's something that we can work on. Um, and then we figure out what our average sentiment is. And flow is kind of like uh, reduce, except it does two things. It, does, it keeps the intermediate reduce around, but also every time there's a signal to it, every time there's a new piece of data that goes in, um, there is a new computation that comes out of uh, the channel, uh, the target channel. So you know, all, all of these things that don't take parameters are actually implemented as um, channels um, and then there's a shadow that does a mult on the channel so you can have multiple taps. And when you access any of the things, you're actually accessing, you're putting a tap on the thing that you're accessing. Um, and so we flow the stuff through so that we sum up our positives and we increment our counts and we start off with um, a seed value and then we do all that stuff to filtered sentiment and then our averages is just the average sentiment. So what we do is we basically have some data that goes in and some stuff that comes out. So let's actually see, oh, let me go back to the slides, whoops. Come back here slides. Ah. Yes, Keynote, I would like to play, please. I hate when that happens, okay. So um, I'll wave my hands later. I've been waving my hands a lot, and I have 15 minutes to actually do a demo. That won't take 15 minutes, so I'll stop waving my hands. So here's the program that we had. Um, I'll actually change it around a little bit to change the uh, sentiment stuff. And I'm going to run it on the server. So we run it on the server. Hello. And what we see is we see down at the bottom, um, we have a negative count. Um, negative sum, average, positive count, and let me run it again. And what you'll see is you'll actually see it as if data was streaming in. So we see the first one, the second one, the third one. And the way that this is implemented under the covers is that we're actually sending a the, all the computations happening on the server, but there's one channel that listens to um, average and just pipes that channel over to the browser so to the stuff on the server, it's all looking like I'm just piping the data around. We can also run this in the browser. And what I did for running it in the browser, it actually will take a few seconds. Actually, OK, so uh, for running it in the browser, I only have um, one data element. So I'm going to take the filtered sentiment and say with sentiment. And we're going to run it in the browser. And you'll see that there was whatever the data I had for that one tweet um, turns out to not be either positive or negative sentiment. I should stop back, step back and say, what's the sentiment? So if you're sitting there live tweeting and you're going, this Dave guy is a boring moron, that would be negative sentiment. And <laughs> there are a couple of thousand words that when they're contained in um, a sentence or a paragraph, they indicate negative sentiment. And there are other words like, wow, this just lit up the room, like David burning down in flames. OK, um, <laughs> that would appear to be positive sentiment, even though it's not necessarily positive. So sometimes sarcasm can throw things off. But one of the things that it turns out is very interesting to people who run bigger shows than Alex does, is what's the live sentiment of tweeters when they're watching keynote addresses? Who are the people who do well? Who are the people who don't do well? And can we like take the hook and pull this guy off stage because he's bombing? So one, one of the interesting things that, um, one of the interesting things was the um, sentiment analysis of the Oracle open world uh, conference when Larry Ellison announced, I'd rather watch my boat win the world's, uh, the America's Cup than talk to you guys. <laughs> that was a huge negative. There was a huge ups 
uptick in the number of tweets, but they were all negative. Um, and actually, let me show you the data set that I'm using, which uh, is right over here. So the data set on the server I pulled uh, from a couple of weeks ago, I guess it's about a month ago, and it was during the government shutdown. So I basically pulled um, live Twitter feed. Let me see if I can make this go away. Um, and so the live Twitter feed is um, everybody who had the hashtag shut down in their tweet. I captured about 10 minutes worth of it. I figured there would be some sentiments in there. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> and then we run it through an analysis that um, splits the you know, pulls out punctuation, splits by word, looks up the word in this list of about 5,000 words, which in the list of about 5,000 words was done as a research project, and um, I'll have the source code up uh, probably tonight, and you'll be able to actually see the link to the research project. So what do we do for the sentiment analysis? Um, the sentiment analysis is actually just a single function over here. It's not really a hard function. You know, what do you do? You split, it, it's a couple of regular expressions to split up the sentence, and then you filter for uh, whether or not the, um, the words that we care about appear in, um, in the list of positive or negatives. And if they do, we increase the negative count, and if they don't, we increase the positive count. So let's run this on the server, and you can see that we have a lot more stuff coming in. So we have, um, we have a lower negative sentiment and a lower positive sentiment, because in this case, we're not filtering out um, the the zeros. So basically, you know, tweets, which is, oh yeah, planning to go to dinner, shut down. Um, <laughs> okay, that's going to be neither positive nor negative, but you'll, you'll have ones that have more words. Um, the key thing, and let me go back to the slides. Thank you, Keynote. I, maybe if it's not. Um, one of the things that I think is really important for people, for humans, is to be able to play with things and manipulate things. And we're all, we're all REPL fans here. And by giving people the ability to play with data in the browser and then play with data on the server is really huge. Because you can play with your limited data set. You can say, OK, you know, what happens if I uh, Pardon me while I cut him paste um, the sentiment filter. You know, what happens if I filter this? Um, how do things change? Uh, what if I want to check for people who are particularly positive but don't care nearly about as much about people who are negative? You know, you start asking questions like that. And by being able to run data with a limited set, or run your computation on a limited set of data, it's really, really important. And you know, for the people who are doing the big Hadoop jobs, what do they do? It's batch processing. Who here was old enough to use an IBM 360 and batch punch cards? Yay! I'm not the oldest one in the room. <laughs> I still have my green card. Um, what people couldn't do in batch pro processing land was people couldn't play with their equations. They couldn't play with what was important to them. Why the PC took over was one, two, three, because you could like, load some data in, you could play with it, you could get your formulas right, and then you could, could chunk, could chunk, could chunk that stuff over and over again. Being able to play in a REPL or being able to play with your data in a browser is really important, and then you ship the data across to the other tiers. So, the playing with things, the direct manipulation is so important for us humans because with the exception of a few people in the world, almost nobody can deal with a pure blinking cursor. Almost nobody can deal with something where they're not standing on the shoulders of other giants. And you know, it's actually side rant. Um, one of the reasons open source is so great is because we're all standing on the shoulders of giants and those giants is us. And it's really cool because we can each take and tune and tweak and learn from what other people are doing rather than having the data siloed. And that's also, 
enabling that power or re-enabling that power to people I think is really important because businesses will do better when the business analyst doesn't have to like wait three weeks for the Hadoop job to be written and then go play with it and realize that, well, it's close enough so I'm not gonna spend another $5,000 of my budget money and wait another two weeks to get the thing changed around. So we've done the JVM server, we've done the browser demo. The thing that I don't have, and I'm shedding a tear about this, <laughs> was I realized that I couldn't get, um, I, was, I had the demo set up to work with Reoc, except Reoc, for their MapReduce, takes a JavaScript function. I didn't realize this until late last night. It takes a JavaScript function and expects a value, and there's no way of doing anything asynchronous. So there's no callback. And so what that means is that with the way that I have the whole pipeline set up, I can't say, golly gosh, I have this pipeline set up. I'm gonna put a value in and get a value out during the same function. I tried it and I sat down with David and David was like, uh, no. <laughs> but um, anyway, so we're gonna, I'm, I've actually been having a good conversation with the React guys about um, enhancing their MapReduce stuff. And really, I will have a MapReduce demo with the exact same code running on React in, by the end of the year because it actually means something for one of my clients. Um, so that's the demo, that's the rant. Do uh, you guys have questions? I've got six green minutes left. No? Oh, I'm sorry, hang on. Let me put my other glasses on because I can't see worth a damn. My reading glasses on. Okay, there in the back. Um, the, the sentiment analysis was not weighted. Let me, let me go in and show you the code. So if we go to, um, so here's the code for the sentiment analysis, which um, splits, uh, replacing some symbols, and then, um, actually, let me go to the other one. Uh, let me go to the closure stuff. Uh, it turns out the regular expressions between closure and closure script are a little bit different, and so, um, anyway. Uh, so we basically get rid of all the punctuation, we get rid of all the control characters, um, we turn it into a lowercase, and then we split it spaces. Um, with that, we then filter by positive or negative, and the set of negative is just these words, and the set of positive is another set of words. Um, but there was no, uh, there's no waiting. Uh, the, the research paper was actually really interesting to read, um, and I'll, I'll actually tweet the link so that you guys can take a look at it. And, uh, but at the end of the day, the amount of extra value you get from being really good about things, like trying to identify sarcasm and other stuff, isn't really a lot compared to just like the kind of words we use in everyday language, because those, for the most part, show our sentiment. Um, other questions? I don't know. Um, I, for the last year and a half, I've had grid backlash uh, because I think that so it, I can't remember, but there have been a couple of talks, I can't remember which ones, but there have been a couple of talks today about how the paths that we follow are the paths that other people follow, and we kind of go down particular paths. And, you know, we think about closure and Lisp and the kind of paths that we've gone down in closure and Lisp land. They've been fundamentally different than the kind of paths that people have gone down in uh, C and C++ land. And they, the tools shape what we think and they shape how we approach the problem. And I think one of the big problems with spreadsheets is they're two-dimensional and people approach the problems by thinking about the formulas and cells rather than by thinking about the computation as an orthogonal piece to their data and that their data can be represented in entirely different ways. And so I, with that all being said, 
people think in grids and they're really easy and I should try to figure out some way of doing it. <laughs> um, does, that not that, does that not answer your question appropriately? <laughs> cool. Um, other questions? Oh, oh sir. The ways the languages advance. Um, Scala is radically more academically driven than Clojure. Clojure is more practical, and a lot of the pieces of Clojure reflect that practicality. Um, that is, in most ways, for the better. Um, and then you see some interesting adjuncts like. Um, uh, the core type stuff, which is like, okay, you know what? The, the language closure doesn't have this, but there's a lot of interesting things that we can do with the type system. And looking at what Martin is doing with Dottie, which is his new type system language, he is kind of going back to first principles and saying the type system is important, but it shouldn't necessarily be um, all of the language or what has become with Scala, which is it's almost all consumed the language. So Scala programs are less about the data and more about the types than they used to be. And from, at least from my perspective, that's sad because I rarely find that the types help me either as an end developer or as a library author as much as the effort that has gone into making them better. Um, I'll be giving a presentation on Scala versus Clojure at the Clojure Exchange in London um, in about a month a little bit less than a month. And so I've actually been thinking about it a lot. Um, the other thing is that uh, the build tools in Clojure are just so much better than the build tools in Scala. And I have 44 seconds, so one more question. That's it. Thank you all for your time. And uh, 